But Brandon, let's move on into our next topic. And for this one, we it's a treat always when we get to do this, but we're inviting in another patron from our Patreon page. Yet again, if you want to be like Matt today, who's joining us, make sure to check out patreon.com backslash most available podcast. Matt, how you doing this evening? I'm doing great. How about you guys? We are doing fine. Just got done previewing, well, reviewing the preview that the committee came out with for the top four seeds in each region. And we're kind of keeping the March Madness theme going because what you wanted to talk about today was basically one-and-done teams, and are they really the blueprint for success when it comes to the college season and really for March Madness? So we're going to get right into it. I'm going to ask you first, Matt. Are one-and-done teams really the blueprint for success when it comes to making the tournament and being successful in March Madness? Uh, I do not think so, Uh, you know, plain and simple. Um, I think there's there's argument to be had there, and we can probably get into that, but what you're seeing, especially this year, probably more so than any year that I can remember, is a lot of teams at the top that don't have one-and-dones and and, uh, a lot of influence from maybe not even just necessarily seniors, but for sure upperclassmen leading their teams. So I I don't think it's the blueprint, and I think you've been seeing that trend in the last few years. Um, there's, you know, Duke and Carolina have won within the past few years, so, so you're thinking, what are you talking about? They they always have one and done. And they do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're leading their team. And what you'll notice even within those teams is that there's a heavy upperclassman influence that that brought those teams through the tournament. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right, Matt. I think that one of the teams that a lot of people would look at when you talk about one and duns, it's going to be Kentucky and John Calipari. You know, he's he's been one of those guys who's made a living off the one and done rule. I mean, he goes out and specifically recruits based because of it. Six elite eight appearances, four Final Four showings in in eight years. I mean, this guy has, he's been very, very successful. Um, But I think even though he's been super successful, I think that you can see where Kentucky's at this year. They have struggled. Will they be around? Yes, but not what they have been. Um, You've seen Duke's recent struggles, but... One of my things that I want to bring up, and I and I have brought it up a number of times, is take a look at an Oklahoma team from a couple of years ago where they kind of rode the hot hand of Buddy Heald. And Buddy Heald was not a one-and-done player. Mm-hmm. And it's actually a really good thing that Buddy Heald was not because he stayed in school, he fixed his shot, and I think it helped make him a better NBA product. Now... Are one and done teams? Can they be good? Can they produce some really good players? Yeah, we've seen it. I mean, I I can tell you a list of players. I wrote them down: Carl Anthony Towns, Demarcus Cousins, John Wall, uh, Kyrie Irving, Anthony Davis, Jabari Parker. You know, all these guys have been one and dones, and their teams have been pretty darn good. But is it is it a recipe for success that can be sustained for many years to come? I'm with you, Matt. I don't think that that can be the continuous blueprint that we see as we continue on with college basketball into the next many years that it will be in existence. Well, and the thing that I'm looking at right now is kind of to – there's two things I'm looking at. One, I'm going to go back to the past, and then one, I'm going to basically stay here in the future. And the first one I look at is I'm just looking at the final fours. And with how far I've gone back, maybe you can go a little further, but just off my eye test here, the last, what, four championships that we've had, so 2014, 15, 16, and 17, one of the teams in the national championship has had upperclassmen leadership. Last year's Gonzaga team. Yeah, Gonzaga team. The Gonzaga team. Gonzaga. They're, not the Zog. Gonzaga. They're the Zags. I always get that wrong. Gonzaga team. They were a team not built on one and duns. You look at Villanova 2016, not built on the one and done. You look at Wisconsin in 2015, not built on the one and done. You look at that Kentucky, or not Kentucky, Connecticut team that beat that Kentucky team in 2014, not built 
on the one and done. And then you look at teams just this year. We just looked at some of the number one seeds right now that the committee has. You have the Virginia Cavaliers. They're led by guys like Devon Hall and Isaiah Wilkins on the scoring end for Hall, on the rebounding end for Wilkins. you got a team like Xavier who you've got Kareem Cantor and you have um, Trevon Blewett who are also there. You have Villanova, which has their senior leadership. You have Purdue that has their upperclassmen leadership. I feel like all of the one seeds this year and from what we've seen in just the championship game the last four years – if I'm a coach, I'm looking at it and going, you know what? Maybe I don't need to go ahead and get a one and done. I should build my team for upperclassmen, and that'll help me basically have better success. Because you look at the Zags in uh, Gonzaga, they're usually a team, if I'm not mistaken, they're not a one and done team. You know what I'm saying there, Matt? No doubt. Yeah, I, I think you're 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 spot on. I mean, I think last year maybe with Gonzaga they had more talent than they're used to, at least in terms of mm-hmm. you know y- younger talent. But um, but but obviously still there was that veteran presence that carried them through through the whole season and into the tournament that deep run. I think that one of the things that you have to look at is. And and I'm not going to just do this. I'm I'm going to do this in part, mm-hmm. but not solely because it's the team that Matt's always going for. But <laughs> Matt, look at where per, look at where Purdue's been the last couple of years. You know they're they're they haven't they haven't made it yet, but they're they're almost always elite eight, and they're never a team that's talked about as a as a team that's looking for the one and done. I mean, you can take a look right now, Isaac Haas. I mean, he's one of their big guys. He's a senior. I mean, there's your senior leadership right there. And that's a team that consistently they haven't they haven't quite been able to get over that that elite eight hump or or, or mental block. Uh, but but they're close. You know, every year it's it's like they they get a, you feel like they get a little closer, a little closer. And they're doing that with with of, of course, you know, some freshmen on the team, but but senior leadership, upperclassmen leadership. And and I mean, they're just they're just an example. Um, we saw, you know, from from Michigan State in terms of in terms of Miles Bridges, he comes back. You know, he wasn't just a one and done player. He he came back because he not not just because of basketball, not just you know because if he wanted the money and everything. I mean, his mom told him, "Go, go to the NBA. I, mm-hmm. I got bills to pay. You need to pay my bills." <laughs> and he said, "No, ma. You know, I need. I want to go back to school. I liked the experience. I liked the relationships I built. It's not just basketball, and you know, not." Not as many guys are always thinking the way that Miles was thinking in that situation. But again, that's a that's a different sort of thinking. And that's now him as, you know, no longer a freshman wanting to stay and and, and continue to play basketball because he likes the college aspect. You see a lot of these guys that we, we don't talk enough maybe about the guys that aren't the one and dones that do stay that mm-hmm. are the seniors that have that senior leadership. We hear so much about, uh, you know, the, the one and done type of players, but we see a lot of these teams they're built off of their seniors. Yeah. And, and no doubt. And so I guess I, I saw this interesting graphic in, in the Purdue game the other day, actually. Um, and it was true freshman contributions for the AP top five teams at the time. Obviously, that's been shaken up a little because of all the chaos last week. But um, it broke down the percentage of minutes that freshmen play on those teams and the percentage of points. So let me read those real quick. Okay. So Villano- Villanova, minutes 13% from freshmen. Virginia, 2%. Purdue, 6%. Michigan State, 15%. And Xavier, 20%. So, I mean, right there, Xavier is the only one that – you know, one out of the five players on the floor for the whole game is a freshman. The rest are hurt lower or even much lower than that. Yeah. So I, I think that kind of speaks to it. And I mean, the one thing I'm doing right now is kind of you and Brandon are going back and forth. I am continuing because the interesting thing, the reason why I loved it when you brought this topic up um, to talk about today, Matt, was – this is a very deep dive kind of kind of conversation where it's like, yeah, we can look at it just for this year, but it's one of those that also you can look at and go, well, how about the past years? And I've been going back past that 2013 or 2014, 
2013, you had teams like Louisville and Michigan. I looked up Louisville for sure. Of course, it was vacated. But you look at that team, and they were led by senior leadership. You had the Peyton Silva, who was a senior, but you also had Deang, who was a junior. You had um, Luke Hancock on that team that was a junior playing big minutes. Probably the biggest name on that team that was a freshman was Montrez Harold that year. Then you've got the 2012 National Championship. This is kind of the one that might fall a little out of that because, of course, Ben McLemore was a freshman, but you have Thomas Robinson and Jeff Whitty, the upperclassman leadership for Kansas. You go um, 2011 where UConn and Butler both had UConn more so because Kemba Walker was the senior that year and Oriaki was there as a sophomore and you had um, Okwanyu, Charles Okwandu there as a senior as well. And I'm just going back even further. You look at Butler before that. You look at the um, Michigan State team, North Carolina teams that were in 2008 Final Four in Detroit. And I'm starting to see a trend of now this is me going back and it's like, okay, we have teams like at least one of the teams that's in the national championship is not a one and done, but I'm looking at most of these and most of these teams, like it looks like it's a pretty mosh posh. It's not like, Oh, the, when we get to the national championship that the one and done's dominate or the um, not one and done teams dominate. It's kind of, it looks like a little 50, 50 there. But I think it's interesting that, hey, out of the final four teams, your final two, at least one of them, is not built off of these guys that go on and it's like, I'm going to play here one year and then go on into the NBA. And the thing I hate, and I mentioned this a little earlier, I think I might have mentioned this before the podcast, the thing I hate about the one and done mostly, and maybe this is because I'm also on the fast break, is I hate how we talk about these guys in draft. And we kind of expect them to be great players right away. And it kind of seems like even a mosh posh of one and dones where it's like some come out and it's like, okay, you're good to come out right away. But there's others where it's like, eh, well, you know what? We're going to have to kind of wait for you to develop a little bit. We're going to have to wait a year or two for you to get the speed of the NBA because maybe you should have stayed in college and kind of worked on some things. Yeah, so I'm... I'm I, I'm with you there. I mean, I think people. I think people generally just forget that these players develop, and the longer mm-hmm. the longer they're in in school, um, the the more they learn, and and the the more skill they they might realize they have. Um, I mean, the guys you're throwing out there, maybe like they crave on blew it. Like, you know, I put him up against anybody, and have a guy take it. My last second shot, I I take him. I know he's beyond clutch and he's he's been there before so i think people just tend to forget about the development that these guys can can go through especially especially through certain programs that have proven year after year that um they can develop these players like no other well and the one thing i want to just throw out there brandon before you come in is based off of what we've seen from the committee already is the committee maybe leaning towards more and I'll let Brandon, you answer this before you go on into your point, is maybe the committee leaning more into non-one-and-done teams from what we've seen with their kind of, what would it be? What's four times four? Is it 16? Their top 16 teams that they've come out with in their preview? Well, quite honestly, I, I mean, I think that the, the committee, it, it's not it's not whether they're, and for the committee, it, shouldn't, it mm-hmm. shouldn't be this way. They should be going and trying to put in the best, the best teams. teams whether or not you're one and done or you're not. I don't mm-hmm. think that really has anything to do with it. Uh, it's just, are you good or are you not good? Are you good enough to be in the top 16 or are you not good enough to be in the top 16? If you happen to be a, a one in, one of the quote-unquote one-and-done teams, mm-hmm. at, like a Kentucky, um, I think that you can... You know, look at this, look at this board and, and, and see that of, of what we're looking at, the bracket preview as of uh, February 11th, uh, you, you look here and there Kentucky's not there. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're not just putting Kentucky there because, ah, you've been, you guys have been really good in the past, you know, you one and done team. No, they're not, they're not doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you have, you have Duke there as a, as a two in the, the East region um, because Duke's been pretty good. 
throughout most of the season. They've scuffled as of late, but I, I don't think it necessarily has anything to do with whether you're one and done or you're not one and done. Mm-hmm. Um, and the point that I wanted to get to and, and bring up is, you know, is it time to just end end this one and done, you know, once and for all? Because in 2006, that's when the NBA put the rule in place that made a player have to be 19 years old or one year removed from playing high school basketball before mm-hmm. they were eligible for the draft. Do we move? Do we move to more of a baseball model where the player, if you're drafted out of high school, you can either turn pro right away or you commit to a college and you're not coming back into the draft pool for three years. So then that way you either completely bypass college and you go right to the draft, mm-hmm. which is what some guys want to do anyways. Yeah. The school's not necessarily for them. Fine. That's mm-hmm. great. Go and head right to the NBA. Or for those that want to be in school, they know they're locked down and committed for three years. And a coach knows that they're locked down and committed for three years to have on their team. God, that would change the recruiting game so much. It I'm, would. Not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but you know, like – the thing that I'm thinking about, and this is kind of creeping into fast break territory, but I'm going to say it anyways. The thing I like about that model, there was only one thing you said that I kind of went, eh, but I'm okay with it, is when you said three years. Because at first I'm like, well, you know what? Basketball's different. What about two? But then I'm like, no, baseball's three, football's three. Why shouldn't basketball be three as well? And then what it could also do on the flip side is like you said, coaches know who they got. It'll change recruiting completely because it's, I don't have to go and revamp my starting lineup basically every single year because my five move out and I got to get a new five in there. But what it could also do is on the NBA side, it could then make the G League, which used to be the D League, it could then make the G League actually like mean something to where it's like, hey, you know what? I don't want to go to college. I don't like the grind of college. I don't like going to school, but I'm not really going to be number one pick in the NBA. Then let's go ahead and um, go to the NBA. I can be maybe in the G League. And here's the thing I would keep in that they have now to your model is I would keep in what the NBA draft has right now of like where I can declare for the draft. Let's say I'm a kid from UCLA. I want to declare for the draft. I can declare, but it's basically, I think the date is like just after the combine. So it's like right after the lottery. So once the lottery is set and the order is set, then I can be like, no, I want to go back to college. Like they give them that much room. I would keep that in there, but your model, and I think it would work because what if I'm a kid that comes out and I'm like, you know what? I want to try to, work at the combine or impress people. And then I don't, I can go, okay, now I'm going to go to college. The only thing is, will college be okay with that with a recruit? That's like, you know what? I might come to you. I might commit to you, but let me try this MBA thing first. Matt, what do you think? And before I go back to Brandon. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's a, you bring You both bring up good points and it's, it's an interesting discussion. I think there's an argument there that, um, getting rid of the one done is best for everyone um, just because, you know, the, you, you get rid of that uncertainty of, you know, when is this guy going to be leaving? Um, do, do I need to expect that I'm filling that slot after one year, um, et cetera, from the coach, coach's perspective? Um, but then, too, I mean, if that's legitimately what the guy wants and he's not going to have any interest in, the schooling aspect, then, you know, all, all the power to them. I mean, that's certainly, you're, you're setting yourself up for a, a bit of a risk there, but if that's truly what, what they want, then I, I mean, I guess let them have it. I, and then Ricky, I guess your, your note on the letting them try out for the combine, um, and see what kind of feedback they get there. I think that's a good idea, but I think just that's from the college perspective, that's going to be so late that it, they can't have a scholarship influx hoping that this guy's going to, you know, back out and come their way. Um, it, it just seems like that would be setting the school up for failure. And that's the only thing that I was like, eh, is because it's kind of different when it's like, okay, it's one of our guys and he might be coming back. 
compared to you're not even one of us yet. I need to know a commitment now, especially when the signing days are and everything. What were you going to say, though, Brandon, before I went to Matt? What I was going to say was that what this kind of thing, what this might be or may have been good for, um, a very, very uh, recent example happening right now in the present, uh, Markel Foltz. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's going on with this kid? You know, I mean, one year at Washington is pretty darn good, and all of a sudden, he can't shoot. He can't shoot, mm-hmm. you know, outside of 10 feet. He's got the yips. I, I mean, it's it's confidence. It's uh, his, his shooting motion. I mean, it's it's everything with this kid, and I feel terrible for him. But, mm-hmm. you know, maybe if he would have stayed in college a little bit longer, they could have worked with him. They could have progressed his game. They could have, as Matt had said, developed his game a little bit more. Then that would have developed confidence. I mean, he would have been gone to the NBA being the player he wants to be, not the player that he is right now. Mm-hmm. So that can be, if you if you have something like that, like that model that I brought up, it actually could be beneficial, not just for the team, for the coach, because then you know that you're locked in, you've got this player for a couple of years, but also for the player, because you're not worried about trying to, okay, I'm just trying to do really, really well in this mm-hmm. one season and then get out of here so I can go get paid. Mm-hmm. You're trying to do well, you know, Throughout, you're trying to really develop and trying to get the best game that you possibly can without within your three years, not just one year where you have to fit what would have been three, four years into one season. Well, and also, and I'm going to use this one draft class as an example, even though it's kind of like a microcosm. It's kind of like what we mentioned earlier, where it's like we're only seeing one year of guys. Yeah. We're only seeing one year of what you we can do. And I think back to uh, what year was this? It was the 2013 NBA draft. Do you remember? I probably know you don't, Brandon, but you love when I play this game. Um, do you remember who went number one in that draft? I'll give you the school. He went to UNLV. He was a freshman from Canada. No, I don't remember. Anthony Bennett. Do you remember Anthony Bennett? Nope. Played pretty well in college. I believe UC, or UNLV went to the second round, I want to say, that year. Matt, did you know that answer? I did not. <laughs> Do you yeah, guys... No one ever knows the answers okay. to Ricky's questions. He has some of the hardest trivia. <laughs> I'll give you a, a double or nothing here. Wonderful. I'm going to screw this up, too. What, Matt, you're in on this, too. Okay? What junior right. from Indiana went directly behind him? Matt will know this. A junior Ooh, from do, Indiana... I, 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 Went directly behind him. Who is it, Matt? Victor Oladipo. Victor Oladipo. Where are the two right now? Of course, I'm not saying Victor Oladipo coming out right away and was gangbusters everywhere, but where are they right now? Anthony Bennett, I don't even think, is in the league anymore, and Victor Oladipo is lighting it up for the Pacers. So, I mean, that's my little microcosm of at least we got to see Victor Oladipo to where it's like, okay, we kind of know what we were getting. Yeah, do you need to develop in the NBA? Yeah, just because you're a junior or a senior doesn't mean you're not going to be have to develop more. But like Anthony Bennett, everyone thinks, oh, he's – and this was a weaker draft class, don't get me wrong. But it's like, oh, he's the number one pick. And it's like, ugh, he wasn't the number one pick. Again, and Matt, right before you jump in, is that – that's where I want to bring in again, like you said, Ricky, mm-hmm. we're all basing this off of – Potential. Yep. The, here's the potential. All the draft. Anthony is. Bennett, I'm sure, had a lot of potential, mm-hmm. and it didn't happen. I mean, that's especially in, in everything in any draft, mm-hmm. but especially in the NBA draft, because a lot of guys, so many guys, you see for one season, mm-hmm. and that's all you have to go on. You've got to just go on the hope of potential. Well, and before we wrap it up, Matt. I want to ask you any final thoughts you've got on one and dones and success for college basketball. I think, you know, generally we'll, we'll see how it all plays out as it relates to this year, but we, we've seen that there is a model of success where you just develop guys and they, they're um, through their skill development and through the experience they, they get along the way. Um, clearly that's a, a path for success and, as it relates to the NCAA tournament. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, but I, I got to think that's going to stay true this year as well. And Matt, my, my final question to you before we let you go is, mm-hmm. do you see this one and done? I mean, not necessarily even going to the model that I brought up, but changing, changing in some way in the next couple of years. I think it could. I, I think 
I think the NCAA too is like under a lot of grief in terms of, you know, they, they, <laughs> there's no, there's no denying that they, a lot of their revenue comes from these guys, right? Oh, like that's... who doesn't want to, who, who doesn't want to see Trey Young play every night? Exactly. Um, so from their perspective, they probably don't mind it a whole lot, but, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised just, um, given some of the, the issues it's, it's created for some of these players, um, and maybe maybe they themselves start to realize that hey this isn't this isn't the safe route and maybe I need to stick around longer so I don't know we'll, we'll see. Well, and Matt, thank you for joining us yet again. And I love having you on the podcast, and I love the topics that you bring to us. This one, a nice one, because uh, not Purdue kind of central in this one, but I'm sure we will talk about the Boilermakers again this season because you are a huge Purdue fan. Um, but for you guys out there, before I turn it to you guys, you guys want to be like Matt, go ahead and check out patreon.com backslash most valid podcast. Not only do you get to help support us, but you get to come on the podcast and talk about whatever it is you would like to talk about. I want to thank Matt for joining us today. I want to thank him for his support as well as all of our other patrons on patreon.com. 